mean, of course, it's only great. Okay, thanks for going up. Most of you. We are ready to start with the second part, third part. Second, third, okay, depend on the part. And uh, so we talk about online complex optimization. No? There might be a button on the side or something. It says it's on. Oh no, it wasn't. Or maybe it was. It wasn't. Okay. So now, right. Um, as I said, we'll, we'll talk about uh, full information problems in the sense that uh, uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll have, uh, uh, we, there won't be any hidden information in, in the past, okay? It's just what, what comes up in the future. And uh, we will take this, uh, so we saw that we could uh, rephrase the expert's problem as a problem of, uh, uh, you know, picking points uh, from uh, the simplex, uh, probability simplex. And this is like, uh, you know, drawing mixed strategies in a game or, or again, uh, drawing probability distribution over the actions that we can do. Now we can imagine uh, to have a, a generic convex set of some linear space. And this is where we are going to pick uh, our, um, our predictions. So our predictions will be points from some given uh, uh, subset of a linear space. And you can think of them as, uh, like in the simplest case, you, they could be a vector of uh, coefficients uh, for some uh, prediction model, okay? In a, in a, in a real practical uh, machine learning problem. And, uh, and the game is uh, similar to, to the experts game in the sense that uh, after we pick our prediction, which again is not a probability distribution any, anymore, anymore, but it's uh, some more general, uh, in a point in a more general space, we will observe some loss. Now the main difference here is that unlike the experts problem when we could uh, write uh, the loss as a linear loss in terms of the point we pick from the simplex, here we're gonna have a generic convex loss that is gonna score our predictions, our uh, WT predictions, okay. And, but on the other hand, we'll, we'll have access to this uh, convex loss, which is the, the full information aspect of the problem. It's just like saying before, in, in, the, in the linear case, we could see all the components of the loss vector, and in general, we, could, we will have access, and now I will be more precise by uh, explaining the, what I mean by access to, to the loss functions, uh, the loss function that uh, we uh, use at each uh, time step. <coughs> and then after we saw the loss function, we can update our model and uh, so therefore we will uh, describe a trajectory inside this uh, convex uh, set uh, that represents our model set, our model class. Okay, so uh, just you know to fix your, your mind, you can think of these losses uh, arising from uh, uh, concrete learning problems like regression with square loss or classification with hinge loss. Uh, the only uh, requirement is that you, the loss uh, should be convex uh, as a function of the, of the W, the prediction of, of, of the learner. Okay. And again, we're going to be uh, measuring the performance of the algorithm in terms of its regret. And now I uh, took the liberty of uh, adding this thing here meaning that uh, I, can, I, I view the regret as a function both of the horizon and uh, of the uh, element uh, of the set S against which I'm competing. I would like this regret to be small, uh, and, uh, irrespective to the specific W uh, from the S. So I want to be good simultaneously against all elements, uh, all the elements of the model space. Okay, from which also my strategies are chosen. But some, in some cases, my regret will uh, scale with some uh, uh, 
properties of the specific U I'm looking at. Okay? So, but the algorithm will be oblivious to the U that it's competing with. So we, we will be effectively competing against the old U's, uh, but the regret itself, the bound itself, might scale with the, maybe the normal view or something like that. Okay? So it's, it's something that you can phrase many learning problems, many sequential learning problems in this framework. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, one very simple idea is, okay, is, is the following. Okay, I, you know, let's, uh, let's look at the, all the data I got so far. I have those loss functions. I have them in my hands. I can uh, evaluate the loss functions on any argument. So I can simply, you know, at time t plus one, I can pick uh, the w in my set, uh, which performs best on the past sequence of loss functions. So this is called follow the leader, okay? And um, uh, however, this, uh, this approach is very natural, but this is a problem because uh, you can phrase it as a lack of a stability problem. So look at this very simple setting. Now the decision set is a convex uh, minus one plus one interval on the line, and I have linear losses, L1 of W, W is a scalar in this interval, L1 of W is W halves, and then uh, LT of W is minus W if T is even, and plus W if T is odd. Okay, why is this is bad for this specific algorithm? This is a bad, uh, is a bad uh, sequence of losses for these, these are losses are convex because they're linear, and this is a convex set, so we are <coughs> in the right setting. Now, very simply note that uh, this is an invariant for any t. You have this property here just by summing up these things. So you, were, you see it immediately. So now the algorithm will, uh, will take, uh, for instance, for t even, will take uh, plus 1 because plus 1 uh, minimizes the loss, which is negative. So he wants to take a positive uh, extreme of the interval in order to minimize the loss. But then uh, you have uh, uh, the loss is plus w when uh, t is odd, which is the next step, he took uh, plus 1 uh, as w, so we'll have a plus 1 as a loss. And things will go the same th way uh, in every time step because of this alternating thing. So the predictor will uh, keep on flipping between uh, one extreme extremum and the other extremum of the interval, and we always incur unit loss on all time steps. So, right, this is not working, uh, we need something, uh, and uh, if we said that this, the problem here is the lack of stability, perhaps the right thing to do is to regularize uh, the problem. So, to... Sorry, this, one, this follow the leader essentially means that what, like who was in better, uh, essentially, arm in the past? Like, which arm was the best in the past? And just follow that one. Is this the, that's a, essentially, that's the meaning of the whole... Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's it. You, you can, yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, now we have a continuous set, we have a convex set of action, but essentially, yeah, you, you want to, we want to go to the best action in the past. Okay. So now, in order to fix this problem, you can add some rigidity. You can add uh, what's called a regularizer in, in statistics and learning, which is uh, something that uh, prevents you from uh, uh, you know, doing this uh, swing back, back and forth uh, in, in your uh, decision set. So you, you, want your, you want your next predictor to minimize the sum of past losses plus something uh, which is not a function of the losses, but it's just a, a function of uh, uh, the, uh, it's a function defined over the uh, model class itself. Okay, and we'll pick this function in a, in a specific way, uh, which is uh, suited, uh, suitable for our purposes. It's going to be a convex, uh, a strongly convex uh, regularizer, and I'm going to be, I'm going to tell you a lot about this strongly convex business and why it's, it is useful. And uh, notice that uh, we also have a scale parameter because we are summing up two things that are, you know, apples and oranges. So we'll have some trade-off parameter eta, which will, uh, it will be able to sort of uh, tune the two contributions here. So this is an algorithm that was uh, sort of a yeah, it's, it's, um, it came up in, in, the, in the context of online learning, uh, was introduced by, was at least uh, uh, phrased by Sachel F. Schwartz and uh, Abernethy, Azan, and Racklin in uh, these two papers. But we see that there are lots of connections between this approach and, and previously known approaches. All right, so 
Right, why strongly convex? So what is a strongly convex regularizer? So in general, a function, a real valid function defined on a convex subset is strongly convex with respect to some norm if essentially it grows uh, more than linearly in every direction. So this is the, the first order expansion of the function and you want the function to grow faster than its linear expansion and by faster I mean uh, uh, more than uh, some beta, positive beta times the norm between uh, the point uh, around which you're expanding and the point uh, on which you're evaluating your function, okay? And it's defined with respect to the generic norm. So a, a, a related uh, notion is that of smoothness. A function is smooth, a convex function is smooth with respect, to, again, to some norm if it doesn't, go, doesn't grow too fast with respect to uh, its linear uh, first, order, first order linear expansion around any point in the domain. Okay, in the, okay, if you do it uh, with respect to the Euclidean norm, then you immediately see strongly convex means essentially that the eigenvalues of the Hessians, of the Hessian are lower bounded for, on, on, on any point in the domain, and the smoothness means that the eigenvalue of the Hessian are upper bounded on any point in the domain. Okay, I don't know, I don't have intuition for different norms. Maybe you do. Okay, cool. Why? Why is this thing useful when you want to do the learning? Okay, let, let's see some examples first in order to, uh, to make it concrete. If we have Euclidean norm, this is a, a squared Euclidean norm with this a half thing. This is one strongly convex with respect to itself. Okay, and because you see it's actually smooth and uh, strongly convex and smooth simultaneously with the same coefficient because, um, well, you, if you write it down, you immediately see it. Uh, let's, be, let's be a little bit more generic. The squared p norm, it's p minus 1 strongly convex with respect to the squared, with respect to the p norm. And the entropy uh, in this, for p in the simplex is 1 strongly convex with respect to the 1 norm. And then you can have power norms. I don't know whether you call them power norms. I like to call them power norms. Uh, where, which are defined again uh, with respect to symmetric and positive definite uh, matrices. Those are strongly convex with respect to the norm they, def they themselves define. Okay, so this is easy. And uh, okay, a key concept uh, which was already mentioned uh, in the yesterday when we were talking about uh, primal dual, I, I believe, is that of, of a convex dual or, or Fenchel conjugate of a convex function. This is a function defined in the following way. All right, you, you see this definition now. So let's see what it means. Let's try to make sense out of it. So suppose that you have actually this, I believe this has to be, okay, let's suppose you have a convex function on the reals uh, that has uh, f of zero is zero, so it goes through the origin. And then you look at this definition here. And now let's suppose, okay, you, 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 take, you want to maximize this, you take here, this is a concave. This is linear, this is minus convex, so it's concave. So you take it, so the maximizer, you take the derivative to find the maximizer, and suppose that you can find some w0 such that this is true. So now, when you plug this choice back in here, that gives you that the maximizer is given by this expression. And this expression tells you essentially that uh, because f of 0 is 0, then f star of theta is the error in approximating f0 with the first order expansion around f of w0, where f of w0 is the point uh, such that the derivative uh, of the function at that point equals, uh, to the equal, uh, is equal to the argument of the convex dual. Is the, was that clear? I don't know. Maybe, maybe a picture. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, cannot, I cannot. I mean, this is really... So. So you can, okay, let's say you have a convex function, you can view the convex function, you have a, a, an alternative representation of a convex function in terms of uh, the, the bundle of its tangents, okay? So now it's telling you if you want to, you have a function here, you want to compute the function dual or the <laughs> convex conjugate at some point theta, you have to pick uh, a, a straight line whose slope is theta and uh, have it intersect the, the, the curve, your function, and then you look at the intercept with the, um, uh, with the y-axis, which gives you the value of the expansion, the error at around zero, 
Okay? So this distance here is the value of the convex conjugate at theta, where theta is this slope. Was that better? I don't know. But you can think about it. OK. Uh, so let's see if we give examples. Euclidean norm, the, the convex conjugate of the, the convex dual of the Euclidean norm is the Euclidean norm itself. Oh, that was easy. OK. Uh, how about p norms? OK, this is also easy. The convex dual of the squared p norm is the squared q norm, where the q norm is the dual, uh, um, uh, is the dual parameter of, uh, of p, meaning, meaning that. OK, this is also fine. How about the entropy? Actually, this is a negative entropy, but it's fine. So the convex dual of the entropy is the log of the, of the sum of exponentials. You, you do your computation, and it turns out to be OK. How about the power norms? This is also easy. OK, these, these were positive definite. Uh, and um, so you, you, will, uh, you take the, 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 the convex uh, dual of the power norm is the power norm defined by the inverse of the matrix. OK? So you can, you can play with these things. You can make computations. And it's fine. It's nothing uh, too complicated. So let's see some properties of these uh, strongly convex functions. So the convex dual, it's amazingly, whenever the function you start with is strongly convex, so it's not only convex, but it's strongly convex, its convex dual is everywhere differentiable. And it's also 1 over beta smooth, where beta is the uh, strongly convex parameter. With respect to the norm, which is the dual norm of uh, the norm uh, with respect to which uh, the function was uh, originally strongly convex. OK. And the second thing is that uh, you remember, in order to compute uh, the convex dual, you had to resolve, you had to solve, oops, you had to solve a maximization problem. Now, the maximizer of that maximization uh, uh, problem uh, that gives you the convex dual is actually the gradient of the dual. So it's quite amazing. It's true. You can find it in any book on, uh, on uh, convex analysis. And uh, this turns out to be very useful. Because now, OK, let's go back to our follow the regularizer leader. This is our, you know, this is our champion for doing online convex optimization. We saw that follow the leader didn't work. And we are hoping that by adding regularization, we get something useful. We get some nice bound. So OK, we're going to pick this strongly convex regularizer. And we now have, uh, we know a lot about uh, these, uh, these beasts. So we can uh, uh, hope that uh, something, uh, something interesting comes, comes out. So the first thing we do is that, uh, OK, we, we want to get rid of, uh, of convexity. We want to transform the original uh, convex, well, the, the, uh, the original problem, which was with the convex losses, we want to linearize it. How we do linearize it? So this is a, a, a distantaneous regret. You want to bound the sum over t of these differences. This is your regret with respect to u. And the way you do it is that you just take a Taylor expansion, and because the, functions, the function is convex, you can uh, drop the negative second order term and get an upper bound. And now you have these gradients, which are vectors, uh, so you can view this as a linear problem in which your loss vectors are the gradients. OK? So do you, did you lose too much? Well, you know, if you are able to cope with any convex loss, linear losses are convex. So what the hell? You didn't lose much. You're, so you're still in the convex case. I mean, it's, it's a special case, if you like. Uh, OK, so now you want to rephrase your follow the regularizer leader. You want to make it easier. You want to cheat a little bit to say, OK, I want to solve it uh, not using the original uh, convex losses, but I want to solve it uh, by putting the gradients instead of the convex losses. Because I'm now I'm, I'm looking at a, a, a linearized regret. So OK, I'm using the linearized losses directly in the definition of the algorithm. I can do that. I know the past gradients. This is, this is uh, just, uh, you know, I just need the gradient information. This is all I need from past loss functions. OK? Now I can look at this. This is, again, my follow the regularized leader. But I have now the gradients instead of the losses. And now I can just call this thing over here, I can call it minus theta. Why not? Nobody prevents me from doing that. Now I have a minus here. I can uh, write this argmin as an argmax by flipping the signs. So this minus becomes a plus, and this plus becomes a minus. And now this, oh, oh this looks really like the, the thing we had in the previous slide. Not by chance. It really looks like the thing we had here. 
ah, so since the function, uh, the regularizer was strongly convex, I can write this thing as a, the gradient of the convex dual of my original regularizer evaluated at the sum of the gradients of past losses. Why did I do this? I mean, what's the, I mean, this is well, nice, but uh, well, the real reason for doing that, now I can really have a sweet and short analysis of this algorithm by using this sort of a formulation. Okay, so let's see what do I get. I get the following thing. So I know now that I can write my, the solution of my argmax, okay, which was my weight. Okay, now I can write it like this. Here it is. This is my next uh, model, my next prediction. I can write it as the gradient of my, of the dual of my regular, regularized, evaluated at the sum of the gradients of past losses. Okay, I can do that. And uh, now I can uh, rewrite my follow the regularized leader with the linearized losses in the following way. I, I, I do this prediction, I suffer some loss, I compute the gradient, and I update my parameter theta here by adding up the gradient. Remember, this theta was the, the sum of uh, negative gradients, so I, I put the negative gradient in the sum. Okay. So you see, I have a gradient step here. But then I have a, a projection step in which I'm using, I'm changing the geometry of the problem because I'm not uh, uh, predicting uh, in the trajectory of the gradient descent, which is this, but I'm predicting in a, in a, by mapping uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the gradient descent into a different space using this mapping, this uh, vector mapping. Okay, so I'm changing the geometry of the problem and I'm hoping this is gonna help me uh, in order to get uh, nice bounds, okay? Okay, this was a little tough, let's see. Uh, okay, there's a little trick here. So, you remember, so somehow it, there, there's some magic here because you see this guy is actually taking uh, in account the fact that I want my next model in the set S, okay? So, this, this thing here is defined everywhere. So the domain of this, uh, of this function is, uh, is the entire linear space. I can evaluate on any theta. Indeed, my gradients are not restricted any, any, are not at all restricted. These gradients will wander in the, in the linear space, but my prediction will always belong to the set S because I, my strongly, my strongly, strongly convex regularizer is defined on that, on that domain. So, this, this operation is also uh, implicitly doing a, a projection in the domain. I can have uh, an alternative version which uh, actually makes this projection explicit. And this is the alternative version of mirror descent which makes this projection, uh, projection step explicit. And for, unfortunately, it will be a projection according to something which is called the Bregman divergence, which is a notion of, uh, it's not a distance, but is uh, a convex uh, thing according which to which you can project on a convex set uh, which is induced by your regularizer. What is the advantage of explicitating, uh, making explicit the projection step? It's uh, because essentially s many times uh, I pick a regularizer which is defined on, on the entire domain like a norm, like a squared norm. I can pick like the p norm, squared p norm as a regularizer. This is defined on the entire uh, uh, d-dimensional real space, but then I want to restrict my prediction on some space. So I have to, you know, I have to restrict my regularizer onto this space and make it infinite uh, outside of this uh, set S. And uh, this makes things uh, kind of ugly to work with, so I can actually uh, rewrite the online Miller descent using this alternative formulation and I will be able to use a, a regularizer defined on, 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 an, on the entire space and then by, by means of this projection to project onto any convex set I'm interested in. Okay? And this I can do not with any regularizers but with many of them. I, 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 at least I need the, uh, the regularizer to be differentiable to do it. Okay? So let's see some examples of these things. So good old online gradient descent, or gradient descent, I can run it in an online fashion, okay? So I have a sequence of convex losses, I can just run gradient descent of the sequence of convex losses. So this corresponds to using uh, the 
uh, quadratic uh, Euclidean norm as a regularizer, then you can see that the derivative, so the, du the dual of this, as I said before, is again the quadratic uh, Euclidean norm. And the derivative of that uh, is going to be w. Okay, If I take the derivative of that, I get w. So basically, I'm not doing any projection. I'm just running a gradient, standard gradient descent in the original space. And I'm using that, those things for, projection, for, for uh, predictions. And then I can do an Euclidean projection if I want to restrict to a certain set. Because uh, this is a good uh, regularizer, so I can write uh, this form of online mirror descent, uh, and I will get uh, this, uh, this formulation here. Instead of a gradient, instead of Euclidean norm, I can use a p norm, and things will be similar. Okay, I'll have a, a little bit more complicated update, but essentially similar. But now I can change the geometry of the space by playing with the regularizer. So, for instance, I can use an entropic regularizer, and this will uh, confine my predictions to the simplex. And uh, I will have an update uh, which will have uh, the, uh, this, exp this uh, exponential form uh, in which I basically uh, multiply the exponent of the negative gradient of the loss. Okay? And, this, and then I normalize to, to, to project back into the simplex. So this is called exponentiated gradient. And it uh, was uh, proposed uh, by Irky Kivin and, and Manfred Wormuth uh, a few years ago. And uh, it's now sort of uh, recognized as a member of this online mirror descent family for a specific regularizer. So what are the advantages? Why should I change a regularizer? What is the advantage of playing with the geometry of the space? Uh, and what does the choice of the regularizer buy me in terms of uh, regret? OK. So let's see. First of all, let's see how I can analyze this algorithm. So this is a, a little, um, I'm, I'm going to show you the proof. So it's one slide. So, so this is the regret bound that you get. So let's see. Um, you get a constant term, which is a term that depends on uh, the, the value of uh, the, um, of, uh, so you're computing the regret against uh, some uh, element u of your convex space. And this is the uh, a constant term that depends on the, the complexity. You can view this as a complexity. For instance, in the case of the Euclidean norm, this is going to be the norm, the qu squared norm of the uh, uh, vector of coefficients you are measuring your regret against. The algorithm doesn't know anything about that, so you're simultaneously good against all of them. But your regret is going to scale with the norm. So this is a complexity measure. And then you have a term here which scales with t, with linearly with t, but luckily you have this term which you can use in order to get a square root of t bound, as we will see in a moment. And this term will uh, contain uh, the, the strong convexity uh, uh, parameter of the regularizer and uh, the norm of the gradients, actually the dual norm with respect to the norm uh, with respect to which, sorry, uh, phi is uh, strongly convex. So this is something that you, know, you, you would like to bound, uh, to get a constant bound on in order to get, at the end, a meaningful regret. So, so suppose now that your gradients are bounded, in, at least in your convex set that you're interested in, and that the diameter of your space, phrase it this form, you, you, you can think of these as norms. In most cases, there will be norms. So this is sort of, a diameter, the, the, square root of the, the, the square root of the diameter of the space, actually. The square root of the square of the diameter, if you like, because these are squared norms. And this is bounded by d. Now, if I pick this up appropriately, I get this thing here. This is it's, uh, reminiscent of what we saw for the expert's case. So now we don't have a logarithmic dependence on uh, the dimension here. Uh, we, we still have a square root of t rate, and, but we have a dependence on these uh, uh, parameters here, on these uh, quantities here, which uh, account for the gradients of the loss and uh, how big is the space in which I'm uh, playing my game. OK? And now you can, if you don't like uh, you know, conditional decay, you can think that, OK, if your, loss, if your losses are Lipschitz, then your gradients will be bounded in the dual norm. So Lipschitzness of losses is, is enough to get the bound here. OK, so now you see I have a, a general bound which will be OK for all convex sequence of, loss, uh, sequence of convex loss functions, for all regularizers, strongly convex regularizers, 
for all convex set, uh, sets in which I project, uh, be, uh, given that those sets have to be bounded, because I have the diameter that appears to be here, that uh, appears in the bound. OK. I don't see the time, so it's pretty bad. OK. Uh, let's see, how do I do the analysis? The analysis really relies on, this, on the smoothness of the dual coefficient. So what I, how do I work? I do the, I just uh, write a definition of smoothness, okay, which is that. So I know because the phi was uh, the regularizer was strongly convex, the dual will be smooth. And this is definition. Now I recognize that this is the weight and this is the minus the gradient because the, uh, the sum of the gradients is theta. So the difference of the theta will be one, one gradient. Okay, now I can do, this is really, really simple. So now I can write this thing over here. And now again, I recognize that if I pick out the u, I will get the sum of minus eta, sum of the gradients, which is my theta parameter. And then I have this guy here. Now I go to a convex analysis book and I find out that there is an inequality which is called fankel young inequality, which is completely done, nothing to do with learning, uh, with anything like that, but it's just a property of uh, strongly convex, actually uh, convex duals. So this, this difference is as most that with a convex dual. Oh, cool. Now, once I get here, I can uh, use telescoping to open up uh, this thing. So these things cancel and I'm left out with that. So this is just inequality. And now I can, again, I can look up here and say, oh, these two things are the same. So I can put this stuff back here, just making sure that this is W, this is minus the gradient, and this, is, this difference will be, again, the gradient, because this difference is the gradient. So I get the norm of the gradient. And da, 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 this is my bound. Then I have to take care of this guy here, but this is just, again, a little, a little uh, trick, a little black magic with convex uh, duality. It's not a big deal. So this gets me the bound because uh, I have now my regret. So this is the, where's my regret? Somewhere. Uh, la, 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 la. OK, this is the, OK, this is the, right. This is the linearized loss of the player, and this is the linearized loss of the competitor U, OK? So I, 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 I prove my regret bound, which is this one. Oh, oh. This one here. OK. This was easy. Uh, let's see some examples. So uh, OK, suppose I have a linear prediction. So I have some uh, uh, side information, some instances, and I predict uh, with uh, uh, linearly. And then I, have some, I pay some convex loss. So for instance, uh, 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 regression with square, linear regression with square loss. No, maybe so assume that I have some bound on the derivative of my loss. This is a, a, a scalar loss. And uh, I have some bound on the norm of my instances. OK, maybe the p norm of my instances for, you know, for, for some p. So now I can run, for instance, if I run online gradient descent, the simple gradient descent which was used at the squared potential, I get a bound on this form, which will depend on the, the diameter of the space according to the Euclidean norm. Because I'm using, because online gradient descent uses the Euclidean potential, the squared Euclidean potential. I have uh, this term which depends on the, leap, uh, on the magnitude of the derivative. And then I have this other term which depends on how big are my instances. And altogether, this is, has this kind of form here, okay, at most. Okay, this is the dimension of the space. So now what happens if I run uh, EG? So I change the geomet geometry of the space. What's happened? What, what, what happens here? Well, now I'm playing my game in the simplex. And I see here I have a dependence. Because I've changed the geometry, I have a logarithmic dependence on the number of dimensions. And instead of having the uh, Euclidean norm of distances, I have the infinity norm of distances. So altogether, I get the bound of this form here, which holds for elements in the simplex. So. Um, and now you see, this is very, really reminiscent of experts. Indeed, uh, if losses are linear and uh, they, are, they have a co zero one coefficients, then I really recover the experts bound for hedge. So the algorithm is hedge, and I have the experts bound for hedge. Okay. So this is you, you view it as, as a generalization of hedge for convex losses instead of linear losses. Okay. I mean, I linearize the problem, but I'm still uh, looking at the regret, uh, the original regret for convex losses. And uh, interestingly enough, you can get the same effect, the same logarithmic bound, uh, if you pick uh, a 
square the p norm instead of the entropic regularizer, and then you, you pick a certain value for this p, which, which is of the order of log of, uh, which is of the very close to one, uh, slightly bigger than one. Okay, you can get exactly the same bound. Okay, more examples. So, so what happens uh, if the loss is really is is really is uh, is more than convex? So, we these bounds are tight. Uh, if losses are linear, we already saw a bound a lower bound for linear losses. But what if my losses are I have positive curva curvature everywhere? So my losses are strongly convex. Then I can have a faster rate. And one example of application is really minimizing the SVM objective. The SVM objective for support vector machine is the sum of the hinge loss plus a, a regularizer, which is the squared norm of the linear predictor of my, uh, uh, of my uh, support vector machine coefficients. Now, this is really a strongly convex function. So now you can rewrite uh, the SVM objective as a sum of strongly convex functions, and then I can uh, approximate the SVM objective by running uh, online gradient descent on a random sequence of T training examples. So I'm doing stochastic gradient descent effectively. Since my losses are strongly convex, I have a faster rate than a square root of T, which I had just for convex losses. And indeed, I have a logarithmic rate. So I can approximate, uh, quickly approximate the SVM objective just by taking the average of the sequence of models that are generated by online gradient descent when I ran it on the sequence of training examples. So these logarithmic bounds will hold for any sequence of strongly convex losses when I just run OGD, the simple online gradient descent, uh, by taking advantage of the fact that these uh, losses are strongly convex. I needed to, to use a different tuning for eta because I have to, eta will be tuned slightly in a different way. Okay, so I have faster rates. <coughs> how, about co uh, how about losses that are neither convex nor strongly convex? So there's an interesting family of losses that are, it's more, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, weaker than strongly convex, but slightly uh, stricter than convex. It's called exponcavity, which means a, a, a function is exponcave we, whenever it's strong, strongly convex only along the gradient direction. And this is the formal definition. Okay? So for instance, uh, uh, logistic loss and uh, this kind of losses which use in portfolio analysis are uh, examples of exponcave losses. And uh, all right. So even for exponcave losses, you can get a logarithmic uh, regret. So you get a fast rate as you, uh, you are getting fast rate for uh, strongly convex losses with online gradient descent, now you can get on fast rate, uh, logarithmic rate, uh, even for uh, the larger class of uh, exponcave losses. But then you have to use a, a different algorithm, which is called online Newton step. And uh, this algorithm is using uh, the gradient, but is uh, conditioning the gradient with uh, this, in the inverse of this matrix, which has to do, which will contain uh, the gradient information. The, 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 sort of a, a second order information about the gradients, okay? And this unfortunately is not an instance of, M of online mirror descent. You cannot write this online mirror as online mirror descent, but you can do an analysis using a, a similar uh, technique, uh, but not quite uh, the, same, uh, the same proof. And then you get a bound which contains uh, the same uh, gradient bound, the diameter bound, and they have a logarithmic uh, term instead of a square root of t term. This is for all you in, uh, in your convex set. And uh, you can extend it also, these bounds, uh, to convex losses. You won't uh, get a logarithmic uh, bound, but, okay, I'm, I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. Let's say, okay, this is another example I like. Uh, this is online ridge regression. So this is a ridge regression run in, the online, in an online fashion, fashion, and this applies to square loss. So in this case, you can phrase uh, ridge regression in, uh, in the online setting as uh, online mirror descent with uh, an adaptive regularizer. So your, your regularizer, much like in the online Newton step case, uh, will contain uh, second order information. But now I can really phrase it, uh, uh, I can phrase the old, uh, the old algorithm as a specific instance of online mirror descent uh, just uh, with uh, a regularization that changes over time. The analysis becomes a little bit more complicated, but then I get a regret bound, which has the, the, the advantage of uh, 
not being restricted to some convex state. I don't have any diameter information, explicit diameter information here. So I call this oracle inequality because this inequality, this regret inequality will hold for any element to uh, U, for any competitor U in the, in the Euclidean space. So you see the cumulative loss of my predictions will be at most the cumulative loss of any set of coefficients U plus a complexity term which, which is the norm squared, the norm of U. And then I have a logarithmic uh, term in time, okay? And these are the parameters you can see here. So this is square loss, linear prediction with square loss. Okay, so this is a parameterless uh, algorithm and this is scale free. It, it, the algorithm doesn't have to know the scale of the problem, it will just uh, be able to compete against any vector in the, in the real space. Okay, some more. Now you can, uh, there are more sophisticated scale-free algorithms for, for general convex losses. These are more recent results. So this is another example, which is again an instance of uh, online mirror descent with uh, adaptive regularization. So here you get another oracle inequality which holds for any convex loss function and you, here you see, since you're competing against, you're, you don't have any, any specific loss, you don't have a strongly convex loss, you don't have an ex-concave loss, you just have a convex loss, you will have a square root of t degree, uh, rate. But here, again, you have an oracle inequality. So you're competing against uh, any, uh, any predictor u from, from the entire space. Uh, and you penalize, as before, you penalize with this Bayesian regularizer here, which is contained, which can be any strongly convex regularizer, which is contained in your adaptive regularizer. So you have a Bayesian regularizer and then an adaptive part, which depends on the data. So this is really nice because somehow the algorithm is learning uh, the, um, is learning the, um, uh, the difficulty of the problem in terms of the curvature of the losses is encountering uh, on the way and is adapting the regularization in terms of uh, information that uh, is uh, uh, contained in the, in the uh, losses observed so far. Okay, so this is, a, I think, is a really nice and exciting kind of. Uh, there are not many, very many examples of these adaptive regularizations, but they, they, they buy you these very nice parameterless and scale free algorithms. Okay, uh, oh, I am almost uh, done. Okay, there are other ways to achieve regularization. Uh, for instance, instead of using a, co a strongly convex regularizer, you may use a, a, a stochastic regularizer, is, which is like a random vector picked according to some distribution. And this is the way your follow the regularizer leader looks whenever you use a stochastic regularizer instead of a strongly convex regularizer. And this is called, in the linear case, this is called follow the perturbed leader. It's an algorithm due to Kalai and Vempala, but you can phrase it also for general convex losses. And for some choices of the distribution of the perturbation, this uh, regularizer becomes equivalent to online mirror descent, meaning that uh, the, these, these things will be the same, uh, provided the sequence of losses is the same. Okay, so this is another possibility. What else uh, have I got here? Oh! This is shifting and great. Okay, so one thing that people always complain about is that fine, you give me this beautiful online setting in which you don't have any distributional assumption on the sequence of data, on the loss sequence, but then you are competing against the best, the single best guy in your mother class. If your sequence of, if your data sequence is really not stationary, there's not going to be any single guy who's going to perform best on that sequence. You know, you may, may have a, 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 a sequence of uh, Compet or, or sequence of elements from your, from your mother class that are good for your, that will fit well your data sequence. So now the question is, can you compete against an arbitrary sequence? You're getting close to the competitive, uh, we, are, we are sort of uh, uh, entering uh, the, the area of competitive analysis and it's not really true, but in, the, in spirit, yes. Because we want to compete against a sequence of models, not on a single fixed model. So we want to compete against the best strategy, which is picking a different model at every time step in order to fit the data. So clearly you can fit whatever you like if you can pick a different model at each time step. So the only thing to make sense here is that you in introduce in your regret a penalty term, which is the shifting model cost. So it's the distance traveled by the, your model sequence hmm, a long time. 
So you have a, a, a trajectory of models. You are competing against this trajectory of model. And your regret will scale with the fit of this trajectory of models and with the, the distance traveled uh, by, 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 you know, when, when, you, when, you do this tra when you go along this trajectory. And then you will have, again, uh, the diameter of the, of the space S and some other terms uh, that are less interesting. So this is an, uh, another very interesting uh, uh, way of phrasing. And the last thing I would like to mention here, probably yes, because I'm already one minute over time, but we started a little late. So this is another way of uh, uh, tracking a moving target. So now, uh, let's say, suppose that this is called strongly adaptive regret. Suppose the following, OK, I'm competing against uh, a single model, but now I want to compete against a specific sub-interval in, uh, in my sequence of steps. So I would like to be simultaneously good against all models in my class on any sub-interval of my horizon. Okay? So I'm picking some interval of consecutive steps. And I'm saying, OK, when I sum my losses on this interval of consecutive steps, I want, to be, I want this to be small with respect to the sum of the losses uh, of my competitor on the same uh, set of steps. And of course, the, the regret here should scale with the length of this interval, so with s minus r. Indeed, you can do that. So you can, uh, you can uh, sort of uh, uh, modify online gradient descent to get a regret bound, which will be simultaneously good on, uh, against any competitor in a bounded convex set and against any sub-interval of consecutive steps in your in your in your history, okay. So in retrospect, you go back and you can, and this will be an invariant of your regret for all u all i of this form. And the way you get is, is through a reduction. There is a amazingly there is a black box reduction. You take uh, any online learning algorithm for online convex optimization, and you can just run a logarithmic number of instances of this algorithm and do something on top of it. In, and this will get you efficiently with just a logarithmic cost in time, uh, in, in a logarithmic cost in time, a logarithmic cost in time in the regret, uh, will get you uh, a bound, uh, a strongly adaptive regret bound. Okay, so this is uh, quite, uh, quite nice. And uh, so I finish with just mentioning briefly the fact that you can play bandits also in this more general setup of convex losses. And the idea here is very natural is uh, instead of observing uh, the gradient of the loss or the entire loss function, you just observe uh, the value of the point, uh, the loss that you, of the point you played. This is the only inform feedback information you get. But you're still facing the same regret. Okay? And there is a, a bunch of amazing results uh, from, uh, for linear losses. And we have tight bounds in the linear case. For strongly convex and smooth losses, we have uh, this kind of bounds. And for general convex losses, this was a long-standing open problem. And uh, only recently, uh, well, only recently, people could get the square root t uh, bandit rate for any convex loss. And uh, this is the currently the best uh, dependence on the dimension, which was gotten already uh, only a, a few months well, a few weeks ago. And uh, Sebastian will tell you about that uh, in, in a month, in less than a month, in the next workshop. OK, this is all I wanted to say. Thanks a lot for your attention. Questions? <coughs> the lunch uh, took its toll. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one question. Dependence on the diameter of S or No, there is some normalization. There is some normalization. Yeah, yeah there will be a dependence, but it's although uh, the dependence might be mild, the logarithmic, but there will be the dependence. Yes. In the so previous one where you talked about this moving target. Uh, yes. Uh, which <coughs> one of them? So you have um, strongly adaptive. No, before the shifting time. So the, the losses and the distance, they seem like apples and oranges. Right. Are, are there like normalizing terms out there as well? Um, no. It's, um, it's similar 
to what we had here, you see, here's the same thing. You have, um, uh, well, you, you can introduce parameter in your regularizers, and then, but essentially, it's it's a really like a model fit and model cost. Yeah, you, 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 yes, you. Because I was thinking, you know, I could take the loss functions and multiply it by a million, and uh, right. But the distance doesn't change, so. Uh, the oh, here, okay. There is a square missing. Right. Here, is there a square? Maybe. It was a long time ago, I forgot. <laughs> this is an old slide. Not I'm not point. sure there is a Second square. The question, I mean, there's, that's the role of the regularization right, of eta, right? It's sort of, you can multiply everything by 1,000, and then divide and make eta. eta uh, so, OK. So there is a degree of freedom. Okay, so there is a, this brings me to the only to the half slide I skipped. <laughs> <laughs> so you can think so you can make things a scale invariant. So for instance, so one thing you you can you can complain is the fact that you know if I if I if I have like a, a problem in which I have a, like this uh, and I scaling my instances, you know. Now the scale of the, my problem will change, but you, typically I have a, you know a bound on the diameter of my model space, and then I have a, here, like here a bound on the diameter of the sphere where all distances uh, live. Now if I change the geometry of one, I'm, I, 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 I mean, I, there's no. I should change also the geometry of the other set because if I'm scaling my instances, now my models should scale accordingly. And so there are ways of rephrasing like, oops, all a noodle step in such a way that you have like a, 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 single, a single constraint which tells you that sort of the inner product between uh, models and instances should be bounded. But you don't have individual bounds on, uh, on the two of them. So now, if you rescale everything according to any linear transformation, so you rescale instances according to a linear transformation, the algorithm won't change its predictions because everything is, 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 is scale free. Okay, so yeah, I, I hope this addresses this. Uh, yes. There are algorithms that which are scaling sensitive. Sorry? So optimal regularization is scaling sensitive. But uh, oh, oh, only with respect to, a, uh, to respect to the original uh, coordinate set. So you're scaling, uh, you're scaling on coordinates. This is like any linear transformation of the data. You can rotate it and okay. okay. You'll think about it. Okay. <laughs> so one question I have is that in bounds are all first case. Yes. Just as in the bandit problem, when there is like different algorithms that work when in the average case, if you have like a stochastic underlying model versus worst case, for these kind of convex optimization problems, are there like are these algorithms also good if your data is coming from a distribution, or is there a different class of algorithms that would work well? Um, okay, um, there is. This is ongoing work. I mean, uh, I don't think there's a lot known uh, in uh, in uh, there. There are few few papers that address this problem, but. Uh, I don't know much about it personally. It's uh, it's an, an active uh, line of research. This is all, all I can say at the moment. I cannot. There are a few results. Okay, so thank you again. Thank you.